Good evening, everybody. Um, thanks for everyone coming out uh, with our typical Michigan weather. So anyone who didn't come because of the rain, you picked the wrong state to live in for the wrong season. Uh, so we appreciate everyone coming here. Uh, I'm trying to see if my, my kids are out there tonight. Me and my wife, we've got four kids, kind of in that 3 to 11 range. We're having a lot of trouble working on not calling our siblings stupid. Um, but that is the title of this event, so I'm going to repeat it a couple of times. Um, so welcome to tonight's event. It's the Economy Stupid, Insights and Perspectives. Uh, though, you know, we got the latest inflation numbers, and maybe it should be Insights and Perspectives on the Stupid Economy. I don't know, but we already had this, uh, this set to go. So we have a great panel tonight. We thank Northwood for hosting us. They picked up uh, the meal. They're co-hosting the event. We have a great partnership. Um, and it's great to live in a place like Midland where you, you, have, uh, you can have great events, great universities, and options for people to come out to. I know all the uh, students in the audience, this is what they really always dreamed of doing on their Thursday nights, um, <laughs> coming to these discussions. I'm Jarrett Skorup. I am the Vice President for Marketing Communications at the Mackinac Center for Public Policy. Uh, for those that don't know, we're an economic think tank. We're located, our, we're headquartered here in Midland, right downtown. Uh, we are one of the largest state-based think tanks in the country uh, and been highlighted as one of the most effective voices for free markets in the country. That's from both our friends and our enemies, by the way. Uh, we cover the issues of education, energy, labor, healthcare, government, transparency, and fiscal policy. We also have a news website, Michigan Capital Confidential, and we have a legal foundation um, that files lawsuits. So a little, little bit of everything under one roof here in downtown Midland. All right, now for the show. So we have two great speakers tonight. They both have uh, connections here to Midland and to Northwood. And uh, so we'll get into that. The event is It's the Economy Stupid, Insights and Perspectives. This well-known quip, uh, which it was actually the economy stupid, was from James Carville. Uh, he was a Democratic strategist, and it was a reminder. He had it posted up in their campaign headquarters uh, to remind their staff of what people really cared about, what to focus the campaigns on. Um, the idea that amidst all the noise, voters ultimately care about one core thing. And in this election year, a year that will be filled with personalities, wedge issues, distractions, debates, um, our event is, is looking to refocus uh, our our attention on the economy. Um, but what is the economy? What indicators do voters care about? What do we mean when we even say the economy is good or the economy is bad? How do cities, states, countries, how do we achieve economic growth? Uh, what makes for positive indicators and what causes uh, decline? So this event will take a look at how the economy is doing. We'll talk about the research, about growth, uh, and we'll hear these guys' thoughts on the policies that politicians should pursue and also the things maybe that voters should be demanding from their, their candidates. And we do have one or two candidates out there, um, so you know, I know they'll be listening closely. Uh, so our first panelist is Jonathan Williams. Jonathan is the Executive Vice President of Policy, and he's the Chief Economist for the American Legislative Exchange Council. He works with state policymakers, congressional leaders, and members of the private sector to develop fiscal policy solutions for the states. Jonathan is the co-author of Rich States, Poor States with Dr. Arthur Laffer and Stephen Moore and the book In Defense of Capitalism. He's a native of Saginaw, Michigan, and he's a graduate here of Northwood University. After Jonathan, we'll hear from Michael Lefebvre. Mike is the Senior Director of the Maury Fiscal Policy Initiative at the Mackinac Center for Public Policy, where he has worked since 1995. He's the author of hundreds of essays, commentaries, and 12 studies on fiscal policy topics. He's perhaps best known for his scholarly work examining state economic development programs. Um, economic development is in quotes. They don't always develop the economy. His studies and frequent commentaries on this topic have garnered him a national reputation as a respected critic of state and local government economic development policies. He has undergraduate and graduate degrees from Central Michigan University, and he also taught as an adjunct lecturer here at Northwood. And this is his first time, he tells me, back in this room since 2002, 
And I asked him what, the, what he was talking about then, and he named something I'd never heard of. So uh, quite a while. So welcome back, Mike. Um, so we're first going to hear from Jonathan, then Mike, and then I'll moderate. I'll ask some moderated questions. And then while I'm doing that, uh, you should have some cards around you. Write down your questions. Um, and then we'll go around the room and gather them, and we'll take some, some questions from the audience. So Jonathan, you're leading us off. Well, thank you, Jarrett, and uh, good evening, everybody. As I always like to say, uh, greetings from the land of make-believe, Washington, D.C., uh, where I am based. As, uh, as the great Ronald Reagan, uh, President Reagan always said, Washington is an island surrounded by reality. So anytime I get a chance to get off the island and back into reality is a good day for me, especially when it's coming home. And uh, being back at Northwood University, being back in Mid Michigan, uh, being back uh, with uh, my good friends at the Mackinac Center, who I've had the chance to, to work with in many, many policy battles over the years. Uh, it is so good to be with you tonight. And uh, tonight I'd like to talk just a little bit about some of the doom and gloom that is happening in Washington, D.C., but I'm going to temper that and uh, use most of my time to talk about, I think, where we have real hope and optimism and ability to change things for the better in America if we stay engaged and if we stay in a principled free market limited government framework uh, in the years ahead. Because I do think, uh, I like to think perhaps I'm overly optimistic at times, but I am an optimist and I do think America's best days are ahead and we do need to continue to move in the right direction because there's a lot of threats out there today. So for a minute, I just wanted to introduce, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the American Legislative Exchange Council, my organization, I've been there for nearly 20 years now, uh, after uh, graduating from Northwood in 2005, uh, going to the Tax Foundation and authoring uh, studies there. Uh, but ALEC is an incredibly unique organization and an organization founded on the principles I just talked about. But one other aspect of it I thought you all should know, I know we have Senator Dan Lowers here, a great ALEC member from the Michigan Senate. We may have some others that have been involved with ALEC or are currently involved with ALEC, but ALEC has just celebrated our 50-year anniversary. We were founded in 1973, and one of ALEC's founders, many of you don't know this, I'm sure, was a freshman state legislator in 1973 by the name of John Engler. Uh, he and his chief of staff at the time, Dick Posthumus, who became also very involved with ALEC, were among the leaders and the reason why ALEC was founded. And ALEC was founded because we think there's this quaint idea that we should look to the states for our solutions. We should not look to Washington, D.C. for our solutions. And the idea of federalism, the Tenth Amendment, uh, I'm, I'm going to get into that a little bit more as we go and probably in Q&A. Uh, one thing that I think all of us should be very concerned with is when you see the man on the street interviews that are out there today, whether it's Jesse Waters or other people, and they ask someone on the street, what do you think federalism is? What is the answer you think you get most often? The answer that you get is, well, federalism means that the federal government should do more for us, right? And exactly the opposite of what the founding fathers envisioned. And you know, the, one of the things I want to emphasize, and one of the reasons why ALEC was founded by people like John Engler was, we need to have a robust system of checks and balances. We need to make sure that those powers that are not directly given to the federal government into the Constitution should be reserved for the states and the people of the states. And that when states compete, and that when we use these laboratories of innovation that we have across these 50 laboratories of democracy, people win. Because when people are given the freedom to associate, when businesses are given the freedom to associate, freedom wins. And there's a big effort to really go against that right now in Washington. There's a big effort by the Biden administration. I don't mean to be overly partisan here tonight because this is a very nonpartisan conversation that we're going to have. But the Biden administration, I think goal number one, uh, other perhaps grow the size and scope of government, is to reduce the ability of states to have autonomy and create policy for themselves because they realize when people compete on the merits of policy, the freedom-based policies, limited government and free market markets, those states are the states that are winning today in this race as people vote with their feet, as we like to say, as businesses move from state to state across state lines. And so let me explore a little bit today in the few minutes I have in the opening. Uh, just two days ago, we released the 17th edition of my publication, Rich States, Poor States, that I've authored for the last 17 years with Arthur Laffer, who is Ronald Reagan's economic advisor. 
even when he was governor of California, and Stephen Moore, man, you've seen uh, Stephen many times if you watch Fox News or if you've read the Wall Street Journal editorial page. And one of the things that we wanted to do with this publication is give people an idea of the positivity of the free market results, of the ability of state lawmakers like Senator Lowers and others who believe in the freedom principles to be able to move the ball forward as long as we let them have that ability. So the top 10, we rank the states and we're gonna get into the methodology of this a little bit later because there's lots of different indices out there that rank states in different ways. But we rank the states based on 15 different factors and we're gonna get into that, taxes, regulation, labor policy, things that we know matter, things that the Mackinac Center works on every single day in Lansing. And over the years, I've been in all 50 state capitals multiple times over, and I can say that these are the things that really do matter for economic growth across state capitals. Uh, there's lots of things that matter that aren't even policy related, but things that matter that are policy related are the things that we're gonna talk about tonight. And where do the states stack up? You notice Michigan's not in the top 10. Is that a surprise to anybody in this room, given what's happened in Lansing in the last couple of months especially, right, with the repeal of right to work, with tax increases being threatened? Uh, the states that here are the high-flying states when it comes to the most competitive states in America. Utah, number one. Uh, the, uh, the Utah folks, number one for all 17 editions of Rich States, Poor States. So there's a whole lot to unpack from Utah, and we can get into that in Q&A. There's tons of great lessons, whether it's property tax limitations, whether it's their flat tax, whether it's the pension reform that they've done, or something very innovatively I'm gonna to get to probably in Q&A, and that is their ability to push back against federal overreach. Uh, because one of the most dangerous things that we have going against us, as I mentioned, the Biden administration's efforts to really go at federalism is the allure of the so-called free money. Uh, that Washington, D.C. dangles out in front of states and they say, well, take the money. And then, of course, the consequences come later because there's always strings attached. And as great Milton Friedman would say, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Utah has helped to push back against that. Idaho, Arizona, North Carolina, Indiana, our competitors at the southern border in Michigan, our own southern border in Michigan. I remember the days when Mitch Daniels was governor before the Michigan comeback, before Michigan's right to work and tax cuts. They used to put billboards on the state line to say, come in Indiana for lower taxes and less regulation and better business climate. Guess what? Because of what's happened in Lansing in the recent weeks and months, they're going to do that again. And you can see Indiana is one of the most competitive states in America. Uh, Texas, a long competitive state uh, in our ranking system, one of the big winners this year and you can see some of the other big freedom states south dakota wyoming oklahoma and north dakota and the worst of the worst the good news is michigan's not on this list either michigan's middle of the pack and we can talk a little bit about that and unpack that later but no surprise probably here new york 50th out of 50 vermont bernie sanders vermont illinois our best economic development partners in the midwest as i always like to say our friends in illinois shipping jobs and individuals our way California and New Jersey round out the bottom five. And here's the overall map of where states rank in the rich states, poor states ranking. And I should mention richstatespoorstates.org. You can find all of this for all 17 editions preloaded if you want to pull it up on your phone as we go and you want to ask questions. But let me just say, this is not just an academic piece of theory. This is about how real world economics work, the, real, the role of incentives, the role of states having really a policy resume, whether they like it or not. States are changing policy and states all around them in this dynamic marketplace of ideas are changing policy as well. I think as Rand said at one point, you can ignore reality, but you can't ignore the consequences of ignoring reality. And that is what states do in many cases. They try to ignore reality, but at the bottom line, as long as we have this dynamic marketplace of individuals being able to vote with their feet across state lines and go from one state to another, and businesses doing the same, states can't get away with having bad policy for too long. And this is 12 months worth of data, ladies and gentlemen, right here. Here are the freedom-loving states, and here are the rewards of good policy and what that's meant for their states. Florida now, uh, the free state of Florida, under Governor Ron DeSantis and a very free market state legislature, 12 months, they've gained nearly 200,000 new residents, and these are on net numbers. So on net, Florida's gained nearly 200,000. This is just Americans deciding to move from state to state. That's not birth rates or death rates. That's not international immigration. That is just Americans voting with their feet because they believe in the kind of mix that Florida provides for them. Texas, the second fastest growing state in the country. 
If there are any Texans here, you probably don't like the fact that you're number two in this category. Texas always has to be number one. They're number two in this category, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Tennessee. But let me focus on the first two states for a second because uh, when we're going to get into this, I had a piece of the Detroit News in uh, December, I guess it was, to critique the growing Michigan together uh, concept that has gone on here. Because the one, cre I think, critical element I would think about if I were putting together a commission to say, how do we grow population in our state is, well, maybe look at the states that Michiganders are leaving and going to when they leave the state of Michigan. That wasn't really considered clearly based on the policy recommendations and some of the discussion coming out of that report. But it, as it turns out, Florida and Texas are two of the biggest locations that Michiganders pick up and leave and go towards and vote with their feet. Now, what do those two states have in common other than being big states that are governed by pretty uh, right of center individuals as governors and legislators? What policy element do they have in common or elements? Anyone want to take a guess? There you go, I heard it. You guys are a very informed audience here. So they are both right to work states, where now Michigan is not a right to work state, unfortunately, and they are both states that avoid a personal income tax altogether. That is an incredible economic development benefit, one of the key reasons why we see growth across state lines. And this isn't just one year. Look at the 10-year numbers here based on U.S. Census. This goes from 2010 to 2020. And Utah, number one in rich states, poor states, the fastest growing state in America. But Texas, Idaho, Nevada, Arizona, of course, Florida is close behind. Many states there with no income taxes or lower tax burdens. Um, and then the states are the big losing states from population. Uh, California, incredibly, in the last 12 months, has lost nearly 340,000 people on net, despite having some of the best weather on Earth, right? If you've ever spent any time in California, I go to Santa Barbara every year, host an event at the Reagan uh, Ranch, and I just wonder to myself, how do these folks in Sacramento screw up this royally beautiful state that has just got the best weather and so many things going for it? It turns out big government policies, liberal agenda, high taxes have driven out even folks that really do want to stay there. Of course, New York, Illinois, New Jersey, and Massachusetts, probably no surprise anyone here. The Michigan record, obviously, uh, still work to be done, a ton of work to be done, but on the optimistic side is look at the numbers at the tail end of the single state recession and Jennifer Granholm policies before right to work were some of the very worst years in Michigan history when it comes to this out migration. You can see a market improvement while still losing population after the right to work and tax cut period. What I'm afraid of is, of course, the future. The, the big question marks that we have in 24, 25, and 26, now that there's the uncertainty around tax increases, uh, I know there's the valiant effort, uh, even with the legal work of the Mackinac Center, trying to bring back the lower rates that were promised. There's a promise that we need to get back to the uh, under 4% John Engler rates on the personal income tax. Of course, that's a big question mark. And of course, there's also right to work now uh, in question. So with that, let me uh, just put up the, the QR code. And this is the Rich States, Poor States report so you can delve in because there's, as you can tell, a whole lot of information there over 17 years that we've put together and a very limited opening period of comments here I wanted to give you. But let me just say this. Um, while there is doom and gloom in Washington, clearly, uh, 35 trillion reasons why, if you've looked at the national debt clock recently, the interest on the national debt is going to surpass every government spending program, save Social Security and the Department of Health and Human Services. Folks, that's the interest on the national debt that we're getting absolutely zero uh, for right now because we've racked up the credit card bills at the federal level and there's no relief in sight, at least currently in Washington. It's been a bipartisan spending binge for far too long. Uh, that's something that's a pox on both of the houses out there in Washington, D.C. because people haven't got it under control. Uh, there's a whole lot, as he said, about those new inflation numbers. Uh, anybody that thinks we're out of the woods yet when it comes to inflation and the economy, uh, we have a whole lot of bad news ahead, I think, if you believe that. If you've seen markets, you've seen the reactions. The folks, the, the betting markets show that there's probably less than a 20% chance of any interest rate cut this year, and the, the equities markets have priced that in. Uh, so hold on for a wild ride, I think, when it comes to uh, the investment side of things. But I do think that if there's one thing that comes across of all the positive news that we've just talked about, of states winning because they're competing on principle-based ideas of limited government, free markets, and lower taxes, 
That is the essential American experiment. That's what our founders fought to put into the Constitution, right? In the Bill of Rights, the 10th Amendment guarantees that. And that is what the progressives right now in Washington, D.C. desperately want to destroy because that is a big threat to their big government uh, future uh, for America. It's a conflict of visions right now. It's the freedom agenda that is being largely driven in the states where we're on offense versus the big government progressive agenda in Washington, D.C. And of course, the beauty about a democracy and a healthy democracy in America, we all get to decide what we want our future to look like. I'd say the future should be freedom and it's based clearly on the evidence. Thanks very much. Well, thank you uh, very much, Jarrett, for your introduction. Jonathan, great presentation. Uh, I've used Jonathan's guide for many years at the Mackinac Center to write persuasive uh, op-eds and blog posts myself. I use it in discussions with policymakers and opinion leaders. It's really a fantastic guide for demonstrating the importance of sound economic policy, and I'm happy to continue using it in the future and referencing it, so great work. Uh, Jonathan mentioned that his was not the only index that's out there, and I want to briefly touch on another one that you may have know about, uh, but if you don't, I'd like to dig down into some of the details with it. It's called the Economic Freedom of North America Index. Have you ever heard of that index? Terrific. Uh, my colleague, of course, should have heard, heard about it. <laughs> Well, this is created by the Fraser Institute, and they define economic freedom as the ability of individuals to act in an economic sphere without undue restrictions. And they've published their index every year for the last 19 years and have spent a great deal of time and treasure trying to perfect proxy variables with objective data that they could use across Canadian provinces, U US states, the subnational government, and Mexican states as well. And what they do is they let the data inform the results. They don't put a thumb on the scale. They allow nine variables. The uh, index Jonathan just introduced to you has 15. Nine variables that they believe act as a proxy for economic liberty. The big three categories are taxes, there's government spending, and there's uh, regulation. And the nine variables under that inform that, and there's a distribution of uh, uh, information that their software will uh, identify who the, m who the freest states are and who are the least free states. And then the scholars at the Fraser Institute, they'll look for correlations between their findings, where the states end up in the index, and outcomes that a lot of people care about. Now, in the last index, 2023, the, the state of Michigan finished 31st in terms of economic liberty. Nothing necessarily to write home about. Uh, a long ways away from their number uh, one and two states, very important ones. In fact, they're top 10 states. But coincidentally, if you look at rich states, poor states, the, the volume that was released this week, Michigan's economic performance ranking was also 31st. Now, we, we use different data sets. We use different methodologies. Part of their, uh, their Index uses a span of years versus uh, the last year, and yet we still ended up with this, uh, at least correlation, this link for this year where economic liberty and economic performance were identical. But there are a lot of other interesting correlations that come out of both, both of the work of the Fraser Institute and ALEC. Uh, for instance, the, um, in the economic outlook rankings this year, there are six states in the top 10 that also appear in the Freedom Index. In economic performance, there's four that appear in the, in the Freedom Index. In the uh, Rich States, Poor States Guide, Florida is the number one ranked state for economic performance, and it's the number two state in this Freedom Index. So is it that really just a coincidence, or is there some, uh, uh, something more beyond just a, a correlation? Is there an association? Is there a causal link? I think the evidence suggests as much. Where we end up in this index and Jonathan's matters to where we will go in the future. It matters to our economic well-being today and moving forward. And this is not just an observation. Because this data is publicly available and has been around for so long, scholars around the world have used it in their own studies. There have been 370 
articles, most of them scholarly ones published in peer-reviewed journals that use this data, either the top line numbers or the subcategories, and the overwhelming majority that find something find a positive link between economic liberty and things that matter to us, like uh, economic growth, low unemployment rates, lower poverty rates, uh, more entrepreneurship, and greater venture capital opportunities. And that's just a handful of them. These scholars have looked at all this from all sorts of angles. And not just in North America, they also have a global index that's very important that I hope we can get to in the Q&A. Now keep in mind, too, that the Fraser Institute data is two years old. It takes a while for the government to process economic phenomena and report the statistics before scholars get their hands on it. So any um, harmful policy that has been adopted by the state of Michigan will show up in the data, not next year, but two years from now at a minimum. I'm hoping that things improve, but given some of the policy choices recently, I'm uh, not holding out a lot of hope unless sister states like Illinois uh, get even worse and make uh, decisions that keep us uh, at least in the, the middling pack, number 31 or so. So there are vital metrics that uh, have been released already that I want to share with you. You're probably familiar with some of these. Uh, for instance, most states caught up on their job-related or pandemic-related losses in the job category much faster than Michigan. We have the 13th uh, slowest uh, job creation rate in the country. Uh, we have caught up on the jobs we lost because of the pandemic and a little more, 0.5%. But that pales in comparison to the national average, which is seven times greater than ours at 3.6%. Now, job growth is not the only measure of economic well-being. Economists use something called state gross domestic product. It's basically the value of all goods and services produced within geographical borders of Michigan. That allows us to compare our performance to uh, other states. We're 28th in that category from 2020 to 23. 9%, it's middling, it's not terrible though. We're not California or New York in the, in the uh, rankings. But it pales in comparison to the near 20% growth rate that Florida enjoyed during the same time period. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that half of the states in the um, Fraser Index are also uh, the, in the top 10 states of growth as measured by GDP. Now, in Michigan, we had a chance to really distinguish ourselves in a positive way over the last few years against states that Jonathan mentioned, like Illinois, which is actually adopting policies and has that are actually much worse than uh, we have. But some bipartisan and partisan policy choices have um, tacked really in the wrong direction. You may be familiar with some of these. Uh, one big one that I like to mention is that in 2021, there was a bipartisan effort to create a huge corporate welfare program known as the Strategic Outreach and Attraction Reserve Fund. Its purpose was to give tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions, to corporations selected by Lansing bureaucrats. But there's a mountain of evidence to suggest that this, to more than suggest, that this does not work. One study looked at 35 states. They tallied 2,400 corporate subsidy deals between a government and the corporation. And then they compared it to like corporations that had not received a subsidy. And the conclusion of these scholars who looked across 35 states and 2,400 deals was that there was a starkly negative, quote unquote, employment impact at the companies that had actually been subsidized. So you hear the phrase picking winners and losers in the marketplace, at least with the big corporations, this is a big losing strategy, and yet it was one adopted wholesale. In fact, since uh, 2023, the state legislature of Michigan has authorized $4.3 billion in fiscal favors for corporations, a policy that has been proven time and again with hundreds of academic studies to be ineffective. Against this backdrop, and as Jonathan mentioned, leadership in Lansing actually fought a tiny across-the-board tax rate cut, a personal income tax cut that was put into law effectively in 2015 as part of a larger deal. Fought that rather than give up the $700 million plus that could be used for uh, other spending. Research shows that taxes matter. The Mackinac Center actually performed a determinants of interstate migration study in 2010. And we found that for every 10% differential in personal taxes between Michigan and other states, 
an additional 4,700 of our fellow citizens left the state. So that tax increase we got in 2007 that many of you may remember, 11.5% has been doing damage since, and yet we can't seem to persuade the legislature to let us keep 0.20%, which was owed to us from a 2015 law. We also um, have to uh, worry about other items, including the repeal of our right to work law. This was a proven economic development program. Many scholars have found very positive links between right to work and economic growth, personal income growth, and migration. Not just migration, but even cross-border commuting. So when we had a right to work law in place, we may have been turning northern Ohio into the bedroom community of southern Michigan. The Mackinac Center did uh, one of the most recent right to work studies out there because we wanted to see if there was an impact that could be measured from Michigan's law. And what we found was we looked at 3,000 counties across America and we compared the economic performance of states with right to work protection at the county level on the border with a state that did not have a right to work protection. And we found that the presence of a right to work law lifted the share of manufacturing employment on the right to work side of a border by more than 20%, at least for states that um, adopted right to work laws after 2000. It was still good for those beforehand, but just not as, uh, just not as much. Other bad policies have been adopted. Prevailing wage law has been reinstituted, which will raise the cost of building public uh, projects. There's a net zero carbon energy law that's been passed. My colleague Jason Hayes and a colleague of his in Minnesota estimate it could cost every Michigan household as much as 2,750 per year more going forward. So here's an economics 101 lesson I've long wanted to uh, discuss with lawmakers. If you raise the price of just about anything, less will be demanded of it. So if you raise the cost artificially of living in Michigan, of working in Michigan, investing in Michigan, you're going to get less of it. Michigan's motto has long been, if you seek a pleasant peninsula, look about you. But if we don't do a policy about face, our new motto will be, if you seek a pleasant peninsula, move to Florida. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, thank you guys for that uh, uh, great summary of the, of the literature. Um, so we're gonna move in, I'll ask some moderated questions. Um, you know, Jonathan mentioned Ronald Reagan. So Ronald Reagan said that if Trivial Pursuit was designed by economists, there'd be 100 questions and 3,000 answers. So uh, I'm a little nervous moving, in, moving into the Q&A part of this. Uh, let's try to keep it to one answer uh, per question if we can. Um, so I think both you mentioned that Michigan, uh, Governor Whitmer did an executive order. She wanted this population commission. She said, we're losing population or we're not doing well. Um, and so let's look into why that is. So they released a report. Um, it really didn't have much. It didn't really seem to take off with lawmakers. Um, it got a little bit of coverage, but it was, it was very unspecific. But one, at one point when they were preparing that report, the, the head of the, so Michigan's chief growth officer, so imagine that job, you're the chief growth officer of the state of Michigan. Um, they asked her about that issue on taxes. And she said, what I can tell you from the data so far is that there isn't much correlation between taxes and population growth. What's your, what's your take on that? Well, yeah. first of all, it doesn't pass the laugh test, uh, given what we just talked about, right, and what we've seen, the growth states that are out there. I mean, California, you know, one of the things, the left-wing groups out there that make this very same argument, Center for Budget and Policy Priorities is a group out of Washington. They have their affiliate here. I'm sure Mike is very familiar with doing battles in the trenches against them here in Michigan with their sophistry to try to explain the way the idea that somehow, somehow, uh, some way that the big government high-tax states are losing people, but it can't be for tax reasons, right? I mean, they'll say it's for the weather, they'll say it's for all these other reasons. You know, first of all, like I said, anybody that's spent any time in California knows that nobody in their right mind is leaving California going anywhere for better weather, 
right? And uh, so that, that's the first fact of it. And this is when we get into debates with fake news economists like Paul Krugman at the New York Times, uh, we get into that point. That's an unanswerable uh, comeback for them generally. The other thing is they will point to US Census Bureau survey data, which we've dug into, as you can imagine, in our 17 years of rich states, poor states. And one of the things that they'll say is, well, nobody on the survey, because the census does measure and they survey people when they move from one state to another, they'll say nobody chooses tax reasons for why they move from one state to another. Well, I mentioned sophistry a second ago. Do you know uh, why that is a flawed response is when you look at, I think, the 17 different categories, why they give, you know, why you can choose if you're filling out the survey, why you move from one state to another? Guess what's not on the survey? Taxes. Now, you may be asking, what is top of the survey? I'm glad you asked, because I'm going to give you the answer anyways. And that is, the number one reason why people move from one state to another, economic opportunity. They move for a job or for making their standard of living better in one state versus another. And a clear way to do that is to have government take less of your hard-earned money going from state to state, having a more reasonable government outlook, lower regulations. And of course, that is where we find in the data in rich states, poor states. The states that are winning are the states that have lower taxes or avoid income taxes altogether, keep a lid on property taxes, keep a lid of all those things that matter for people's standard of living. One of my big complaints about that uh, Population Council's final report was how little scholarly evidence they cited for the assertions that they made. I only found three that, uh, really rigorous studies and only one of them sort of half supported the assertion they were making. But we've long known that migration is a subject of interest for economists across the country and for decades. So we actually had one of our scholars go out and do a, a, a literature review what have the academics said? And of course, taxes is one of them. In fact, she cited, our, our economist cited one study that was a literature review of 12 other tax studies linking uh, taxes and migration. Can you hear me? You can hear me? Good. Uh, linking taxes and migration. Some of those were very narrowly tailored to sports and academic stars, but others were broader. And of course, I mentioned the study the Mackinac Center did. 4,700 people move out of the state. And we controlled for all sorts of factors that might otherwise influence our output, like days of sunshine or average daily temperature, because other studies showed that Michigan's climate contributes 0% to negative 1.5% of our uh, inbound migration. So there's a, a, another study that's published in 2006 by Richard Sebula that is a determinants of interstate migration study as well. And he very clearly links taxes, personal taxes specifically, and inbound migration. He found some really other interesting quality of life measures in there as well. Um, and that's just, uh, you know, one. I could go on, Jared, but I think there are other questions you may want to ask. There might be. Um, yeah, so, um, and you both talked about these, these different indexes, um, and you both brought kind of your perspective on that. I was curious, are there indexes like that from the left? Is there anyone on the left trying to develop their own index that you know of over what are the reasons people leave from, from those states? I mean, like, you know, if you have this actual, you know, both the indexes are slightly different, but they kind of talk about the same things. We're measuring tax rates, we're measuring labor freedom, we're measuring occupational licensing, whatever it is, is there anyone on the left doing any type of work for that? And if so, what are they trying to measure to figure out why people are moving? Uh, not economic ones. I haven't seen any out there that address economic subjects that we do, but there are ones that try to address uh, more social aspects, uh, nature protection, environmental issues, that sort of thing. And some of them lump it in with economic uh, issues as well. Uh, US News and World Report, I think, ranks Michigan 41 and uses everything from crime statistics to uh, our environment, some measure of our environment. Uh, I've talked about the uh, Economic Freedom of North America Index produced by Fraser. They also produce a Economic Freedom of the World Index. And it always led me to question, uh, is there an economic index out there that says, you know, North Korea, Cuba, Venezuela, that's the key to economic wealth and, and, and prosperity. But it, hasn't, it doesn't exist because the data would not support it. No matter how you chopped it up. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not a 
you know, my parents, uh, I grew up in Illinois. My parents a year ago moved to Indiana. They didn't do it because of the weather. I can, I can tell you that much. Um, and uh, I'm not so sure on the international that people are getting in lifeboats in Cuba to make it to Florida because of the weather. Um, so you talk about the taxes. You talked about one, one thing I hear a lot from, from people, particularly on the left, um, but I think an assumption for regular citizens is, yeah, okay, I don't like paying high costs for things, but that's what pays for government services. So you, you've cited Florida and Texas with no income tax, Tennessee with no income tax. Um, so is there any measure on what you're getting for that money? Are services worse in other states that don't have those types of taxes? That's a great question, and, and one other point on the indices, because this kind of ties into this too. The left doesn't use it because the results don't come out to how they like, but the other thing is, I mean, when you look at some of the indices that are out there, they're very little concerned with actual policy factors as well. Some of the, you know, whether it's uh, Best for Business or CNBC results, uh, there are things that legislators only wish they could control. I mean, they do things like weather or for quality of life, how are you determine that? Or, you know, other things like that that are pretty nebulous to define. The one of the reasons why I really like ours, I like the, the Freedom of North America Index, is there are things that state policymakers every single session directly control, and that's an important factor of it. Um, now, when it comes to, you know, some of the the other uh, you know, issues on that, uh, Florida, Texas, Tennessee, they have paved roads, they have schools, they have health care systems, right? I mean, sometimes the hyperbole on the left would make you think that they have crumbling infrastructure because they don't have income taxes. But when you look at the outcomes, some of the, whether, whether it costs to pave a road mile of highway uh, that the Reason Foundation, for instance, tracks and other things, they provide all those things, they just provide them more efficiently. And that's the really the key is, you know, living within our means at a government level just like we all do as an individual or as a small business you have to balance your books every single month as you're going through on a business piece or certainly on a quarter with your quarterly tax filings but at the end of the day the way that the states do without a personal income tax one of the most critical aspects of being a pro-growth state is not that they shift the overall tax burden to a sales tax that's astronomically high or to a property tax that's astronomically high. How they do it is government efficiency, living within their means, and actually when you look at the nine states without a personal income tax, he's focused on the big ones today, but there's actually some others that are interesting in that you even have Washington State, not known as a fiscally conservative or conservative Republican state of any stretch of the imagination. They've long been a no personal income tax state. You look at all the nine and you compare them with the 41 states that have any type of personal income tax on wage income and the nine no income tax states spend on a given year between 50 and 60 percent less per person than the states with income taxes and yet they provide all those services and in some metrics even more efficiently and a better quality of those services as they go. One thing that I do think it would be remiss, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk any about is not traditionally an economic topic, but it gets directly to this issue of how do you prove outcomes and how do you make sure services are delivered well to individuals, and that is this magic moment I think we have as a nation right now. It may be the most po important policy debate of our time, and that is the idea of freedom in education, parental empowerment, and school choice, right? Have you seen what's happened across the country? Now. Right now, there's a, a huge attack in Lansing, right, against even the charter schools. I know our friends at Mackinac pointed that out today. I, saw, I was reading the piece. But one of the things I'm most proud of at ALEC, it's been one of our priority issues on school choice and delivering that outcome where we actually have students that are ready for higher institutions of learning, ready for trade schools, ready for the workforce, and having those skills is the ability of parents to make those choices for their own kids and not a government bureaucrat. That is, folks, why we have Governor Glenn Youngkin right now in Virginia, my uh, state where I reside. There was a point in time where former Governor Terry McAuliffe was there with the head of the National Teachers Union, Randy Weingarten. They said out loud what they had probably been thinking for 20 years, and they said parents shouldn't be involved in their kids' education, more or less. And that incensed even some liberals from Northern Virginia, and we have Governor Youngkin in result, but more importantly than that political result is the change of the landscape where we're delivering these services and education, usually the highest line item of any state budget in state and local spending. 
And now from three years ago where our ALEC board member Patricia Rucker, a Venezuelan immigrant, Republican lead of an education committee, introduced and passed the first universal school choice education savings plan where the dollars followed the family to today, where uh, two weeks ago we had state number 11 that has become a universal school choice state. That, folks, is the greatest story that the liberal media in Washington will not tell you, but I think it's going to have the longest lasting impact. And getting to your question on how you deliver services and good, good, good outcomes, you look at alternative ways of providing those services, and that's what the freedom-loving states are doing today. Well, that was, that was a great summary. I want to drive home a point real quick. People um, are willing to pay premiums for quality services, but there comes a point where the cost for the benefit just isn't acceptable to them. U-Haul, uh, if you live in Houston, they'll practically pay you to take one of their trucks to San Francisco. If you can go on their website and look at the price of renting a U-Haul in San Francisco to go to Texas versus the other way around, and there's a stark difference. San Francisco has lots of public services and lots of money being spent on them, and yet people are moving from there to Houston. Uh, quality of life metrics matter to interstate migration and economic growth. In fact, uh, there's been a, really a burgeoning field in the quality of life metrics, and they focus in on housing. Uh, they're, they find, economists find that people are willing to pay a premium for their housing to live in certain areas. And um, some of the things that they're looking for, quality public schools, our own literature review looked at that with an emphasis on quality, quality public infrastructure as well. In fact, there's a study by uh, John Hood. It's a literature review. He looked at 681 academic studies, and he was looking for uh, policies that mattered to economic performance. And uh, three of the big ones were quality public services. So they matter, but like Jonathan said, you can't make them too expensive or let the quality provision slip. All right, well, we're gonna move on to questions to the audience. We got plenty here, we got plenty of good ones. Um, so we'll do about 10, 10 minutes of these, and I will say we'll hang around afterwards, so if people wanna come up and, and ask questions, and um, these guys are, are happy to, to share their views personally. So first question, uh, if all this data is so clear and so available, then why is it that so many bad economic policies continue to be implemented? Should we get the senator up here? <laughs> Well, that is the age-old question, isn't it? Uh, you know, there's, I think there, it says something about our previously uh, maybe inadequate uh, schooling system for individuals getting elected that didn't learn math and didn't learn some basic budget uh, aspects. You know, at the end of the day, one of the big differences between this craziness in D.C. and at the state level, at least states have to go through the motions. 49 out of the 50 states have a balanced budget requirement in their state constitution or in, in uh, state law. Wouldn't that be a nominal idea at D.C. level to actually go through the motions and get back to a balanced budget? and actually get down to spending control. Uh, I mean, I think that, you know, part of the issue as well, and one of my, my great heroes in the economic space, who's a national treasure, uh, who's studying, he's like 95 years old now, Thomas Sowell out at Stanford, right at the Hoover Institute. Hopefully you've seen him, he had great videos, read his columns over the years. I think he gets to the crux of this matter. He had a great line, which is, you know, the first law of economics is we have a scarcity of resources, right? We have to economize. That's the, the basis of economics, right? But the first law of politics is to ignore the first law of economics, <laughs> right? And so that is inherently the challenge. You have folks that have, I think, the exact wrong incentives in many cases. F folks on the different sides of the arguments that Senator Lowers are out there to say, I think my political reward is if I hand out more goodies, and if I promise the people more government and more things, people are going to like me more because I've delivered for them. And that is their incentive. They, and maybe it is working in their communities that people value that. You know, that's, that's part of the issue of misaligned incentives. I mean, another misaligned incentive right now I think we have is far too many people are looking to throw bombs rhetorically and raise money and get on cable news instead of actually focus on the issues and the policies and the principled solutions to get work done. So I think incentives really matter in economics, but also in politics, and that's where we get off on some of this stuff. So I'd like to piggyback on the, all the wrong incentives. There's, um, I've talked earlier about these um, incentive programs where they're handing out tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. 
Nathan Jensen at the University of Texas Austin did a study where he found that a governor who can announce that 1,000 new manufacturing jobs are coming to the state in an election cycle can move 9% of independents into their column. So they have an incentive to uh, engage in these programs in order to keep their own job, whether or not these programs create new ones for other people. And yeah, Jerry, you're going to kill me for going again here. Uh, I realize I, I'm glad we had 10 minutes left because after my opening remarks, I thought it was 9 o'clock already. I was like, wow, I, I knew I went a while, but I didn't know I went that long. Uh, you know, and I think that's, that's such an important point. But the other thing is, you know, why don't people get it right on this particular question is, a lot of times, we don't allow states to fail when they make the wrong decisions and bear the consequences. Yes, we're bearing the consequences when it comes to the out-migration of businesses and individuals. What does that create? Gavin Newsom, you know, has had this fairy tale bid to be president of the United States last year when he thought Joe Biden wasn't going to make it till this year. He said California has a $100 billion uh, surplus right now. Look at this progressive form of government that's working for us. Fast forward to this year, $73 billion deficit, by the way, uh, this year. Uh, but one of the things, you know, about California is you know they just continue to do the wrong things and then when things go wrong for California for Illinois and New York what happens they come out with their hands out to Washington DC and if they have the right occupant of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and they have the right folks in Washington in power in the Senate and the House they get a bailout from all of us to make up for their bad decisions. What I think what we need to do to correct for some of this issue is make people really pay for their bad decisions by going back and actually have to fixing the problems back home and not asking all of us to pick up the tab and socialize out their problems federally. And that's one of the big war on federalism right now is it's not just sending the free money out, and that's a big problem with the strings attached, it's rewarding the bad behavior from the states that are making the bad economic decisions. All right, this is why we do the uh, questions out there. Um, I got four along this lines of the same question, so that's, that's good. It means people are interested in it. Um, so the question is, uh, what is right to work, and why does that matter for economic growth? Uh, right to work simply means that no, one, no worker need be compelled to financially support or join a union in order to remain employed. And that little bit of extra flexibility in a labor market does wonders for uh, the economy in general, opportunity, and it drives migration. In fact, Richard Vetter of Ohio University, now retired, has said one of the great untold stories of American migration is the link between a, uh, the presence of a right to work law and uh, migration. 4.5 million Americans on net balance moved from non-right to work states to right to work states from 2010 to 2020. Now I'm sure that people didn't wake up and go, oh, Texas is a right to work state. I should have moved there a long time ago. But it, it, is a, it re represents an opportunity and for a long time it has uh, signaled that a state is open for business. So um, I think that Jonathan could probably Piggyback on that one? No, that's exactly right. And I will just be really simple and short with this answer in that a lot of times as we've traveled to 50 states, we talk to businesses and they use rich states, poor states for why they move from one state to another. They look at the policy environment in one versus another. They look at taxes, of course. But right to work is one of the most important of the variables we look at because as we talk to these businesses, we talk to governors, as they talk to the economic development agencies when they're not picking winners and losers and they're actually trying to get businesses in more naturally, they say this is a yes or no variable. Like if you're not a right to work state, for many businesses out there, you're not even in consideration, no matter how good your weather is, no matter what other kind of policy environment you have, it's a yes or no variable. It's as simple as that as a business decision. All right, All right. well we'll do our final question here. Um, and an another great one, um, something I was curious about. Um, so when you're looking at these migration statistics and when people move, um, what types of people are moving? Um, is it just rich people who are able to move? Is it low income people? Is it mid income? Who's actually moving? Is it young people? Is it old people? We hear a lot about we need to get our young people into our state or talent or something along those lines. So how do those, the migration figures move? You want me to? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll address that and then Mike can you know, bat uh, whatever I miss out on. I'm sure he'll have a couple other good points on this. 
you know, what, uh, what we find is it's a, it's a good mix, as you can imagine, right? I mean, there, are, there was just a story, I think, in the Wall Street Journal today, some of you may have seen it, how millennials, uh, as they're moving, they're moving to cities, as we all know, and rural areas are losing to suburban areas and urban areas, and that's a long-time trend that we expect to probably continue, but they're not going to New York, Chicago, and L.A., they're going to cities that are medium-sized cities, cities that have a lot of the amenities that they're looking for, but not the costs. I mean, that's a, is a key element of millennials moving from state to state. Obviously, as we know, as I mentioned earlier, from the census data and the survey work, the number one reason why people go from state to state is for economic opportunity and for a job. So that's a big driver for millennials. Then you have, I think, the business owners out there, whether the big businesses that we've seen big companies like Oracle uh, move from Silicon Valley down to Texas, and there's tons of examples of big publicly traded companies that move. Sometimes they move for the right reasons, sometimes they move for the wrong reasons, probably with the handouts and other things that happen, but a huge element of business uh, leaders that are moving from state to state, and one that I think is perhaps the most influential and directly controlled to the personal income tax and connected to it, because the vast majority majority of small businesses across the United States, which by the way, ladies and gentlemen, are the net job creators and have been for a very long time in the United States, they're pass-through entities. The vast majority of them are subchapter S companies, LLCs, others that pay on the individual side of the code. That's why when you're looking at a policy environment and things to change, the personal income tax is so important. The small businesses moving from state to state are moving, I think, more directly connected to the policy environment. Now, the big challenge and one of the biggest first questions I get always when I'm out giving a talk is what about if I'm in Texas? What about North Carolina, Florida, the inbound migration states? What about all these Californians moving into our state? Are they gonna bring their bad ideas with them? And that is a really important question. Now, this isn't a political discussion tonight, this is an economic discussion, but I can tell you the small businesses moving are generally conservative free market folks leaving California to get out of there because they're not wanted. Capital goes where it's wanted and it leaves where it's not wanted. That's a clear incentive. The challenge that Mike and Jared and I and all of us have, if you believe in what we're talking about tonight in free markets and limited government, is when the companies go, employees go with them, and employees, for good reason, you know, I have two small kids at home, they're more concerned about getting their kids to soccer practice on time than they are looking at the policy environment necessarily in a state. So it's up to all of us to tell this story, connect the dots for people as to why is it you have a job in Texas and you didn't in California? Why do you have a better job in Florida than you do in New York? And why do you have a better standard of living in Arizona than you did in Illinois? That is the task ahead of us. Thank you. Great segue. Uh, Dean Stanzel is one of the authors of the Economic Freedom of North America Index, and he's a Southern Methodist University economist in Texas. And he investigated empirically the question of Californians moving to Texas. And his conclusion was, those moving have more in common with Texans than they do with Californians. So a very interesting finding from Dean. And uh, we have a scatter graph, uh, scatter plot on our website. It's in an article about population. And James Holman demonstrates using data on where people are moving by age cohort. And he concluded young people are moving to the same, same places that older people are moving to. Perhaps for different explicit reasons, a, a, a retiree evidence shows will look for more amenities like uh, parks, recreation, miles of shoreline, access to water, that sort of thing. Um, but by and large, older people are moving to the same place as younger people are. All right, well please uh, thank our panel. So before I uh, do our conclusion here, I do want to mention a couple of upcoming Mackinac Center events for you all. Um, <clears throat> next week, Wednesday, April 17th, if you happen to be in Lansing or it's streamed online, um, we, are, we have an event, It's Time to Work, State Licensing Reforms Michigan Should Consider. Licensing is one of those things that are in many of these indexes, uh, regulatory reasons. Uh, next, or on Thursday, or I'm sorry, on, yes, next Thursday, April 18th, here in Midland. If you haven't seen this one, you don't want to miss it. We are hosting a film showing of the movie One Life, which is the story of the inspirational story of Sir Nicholas Winton. Uh, we will have former Mackinac Center uh, President Larry Reed, 
who is the head of the econ department here. He met with Nicholas Winton several times. If you haven't, check out that trailer. And if you're interested, um, come to the showing next Thursday. You can find that on our website. And then Thursday, May 9th in Grand Rapids, that is our evening with the Mackinac Center, an evening of fellowship among friends and celebrating freedom. And that will be with Megan Kelly. So we, uh, I think we've got two Ronald Reagan references so far tonight, um, so uh, I'll give us a third one. So Ronald Reagan uh, was kind of known uh, you know, for his storytelling, and one of the stories that he liked to tell was about a family that had two identical twin boys, and uh, despite them being identical, they were very, very different. And the main way they were different was one was this extreme pessimist, and the other was an extreme optimist. And they were so extreme that the parents, uh, they said, we got to bring them in to see a psychiatrist because, uh, you know, they really, one is just so happy-go-lucky and one is so extremely upset all the time. So the psychiatrist said, okay, let me, let me run some tests and, and let's see what the problem is. And so uh, for, the, for, the, for the first son, who was the pessimist, he brought him into a room and he had this huge pile of toys in there. And the son walked in the room, and he immediately burst into tears. And they said, what's wrong? It's, it's toys. And he said, I would just end up breaking them and being really upsetting myself and making everyone mad at me. I, I'm not even going to touch them. So then they brought the uh, extreme optimist son into another room. And they walked into that room, and the, that room just had a massive pile of horse manure. Um, uh, which, you know, I have an 11 year old son. He actually probably would be pretty excited about that. Um, but they walked in the room, and the son, that son said, Yippee! And he went diving into the horse manure and digging away into it. And the doctors all looked at each other and they said, What are you doing? And that son said, There's got to be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> so this talk. This talk tonight was, uh, you know, we, we had some good reasons and things to be excited about pessimism. We had some, some or to be optimistic about some, some states, um, but we had a lot of pessimism. We got a lot of Michigan not doing well on these rankings, things that we have to fight, things we have to worry about. Um, and I feel like that gives you a lot of time where you're, you're losing hope and you might be more of the, pop, the pessimistic twin. Um, I want to encourage you to be more of the optimistic twin. Um, join Alec, join the Mackinac Center. We pride ourselves on being happy warriors on those things. Um, you know, we live in a country, it does not promise happiness or prosperity, um, only the opportunity for it. Um, and we got to build that opportunity ourselves. So uh, with that, please continue supporting these organizations, and we look forward to seeing you at the next event.